Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Susan Medock, Managing Director of Berkeley Repertory Theater. Susan has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Susan, for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Berkeley Rep has a, a rep that looms very large in the Bay Area and nationally and even internationally in, in the theater world. Talk about the sensibility behind Berkeley Rep. Berkeley Rep is, what, 48 years old? We've had three artistic directors in all of that time, two managers. So when I talk about what's the sensibility of, the rep, of Berkeley Rep, I suppose I'm really talking about a body of work over a long period of time. And uh, I, in spite of the fact that each of the artists with whom we've, we've worked over the years comes to the work from a slightly different place, I suppose what they all share is a sense of the possibility the theater provides, a sense that, that theater is an art form that has something meaningful to say, a sense that we have a unique ability to communicate ideas using the, the context of storytelling that's at the heart of what theater is. Um, and so regardless of who has, been, who has been our leader, our artistic leader, I think that what we've, what we've prided ourselves on really since the beginning is that we, um, we care about what's going on in the world. We care deeply about producing really good theater. We are located in a community where people are terribly open-minded and interested in sort of engaging in a civic dialogue, and that probably defines us as much as anything else. I'm interested in what theater is in today's context. In the past, before we had these various broadcast media, whether today it's cellular and previously it was, it was television and before that it was, it was film and radio, today the definition of what theater is seems to me to be so important. Talk about what defines theater at Berkeley Rep. For me to talk about what theater is and what defines theater, you have to go back, you know, it sounds so silly and so trite, but you have to go back to the cavemen and women. <laughs> but the notion that what theater has always been and, 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 and probably will always be is about at least two people in a room together, one telling a story and the other one listening to it and engaging with it. And, um, and so the, the, the form changes, the accoutrement that surrounds it changes, but ultimately we're about sharing stories in a dark room. And, um, and I, when, I, when I talk to the young fellows who come and train with us every year, I always start the year by saying to them that, that theater and democracy began in the same place at the same time in terms of a formal structure. Mm -hmm. and, and the notion was that as, as citizens, we needed to dissect ideas. We needed to sort of affirm and question who we were in the context of a theatrical format. That's really, that's the beginnings of it all. And that was actually part of the construct for democracy. So years later, you know, yes, we've, we, now, we, we went through the phase of was television going to kill the theater? No, television didn't kill the theater. Was film going to kill the theater? No, film was, was cable going to, you know, none of that seems to have worked. And I think it's because at core, um, there is something about the fact that it is live, that it is authentic, that it is an unmediated art form that, if anything, is only increasing in value at a time when live and authentic is increasingly rare. So we're finding that, um, that the function hasn't changed in all these years. Um, the, 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 um, I think we use different tools than we used to. Our narrative thread has shifted over time. Um, there are generational differences in terms of how people absorb information and, um, and, and how they think about narrative form. But the, but the, 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 the constant is that we sit in a room with each other we uh, communally experience something that we know is not real, and we accept its truth for some period of time. Talk about the board and the way the board sees their purpose and, and, and the way the staff sees the board's purpose. We have, a, we have a fantastic board and always have. Interestingly, once again, this theater, from practically from the day that they were founded, was committed to having a community-based board. Many, many nonprofits, they start with their friends, and eventually there's a difficult transition where they move to outside leadership. This, this, the, the Michael Ibert who founded this company, he, he understood from the very beginning that the strength of this theater would be that we, there was a sense of, of stewardship on the part of the community. And so our board comes from all over the Bay Area. We have people from Contra Costa. We have people from the peninsula. We have people from Marin, San Francisco, the East Bay, 
and um, and they they um, have a, a, a real diversity of experience. We have a mathematician, which I love because whenever he turns a problem sideways, it looks different, uh, and he tends to he tends to make ideas. Um, he, he tends to, to frame issues in a, in a way that makes me sometimes really have to go, oh, I haven't thought about it that way at all. Um, I tend to think that my job is to, to be somewhat conservative. So I will, uh, there's times when I'll bring the board choices. And very often, they will choose to take the more um, ambitious choice. As Tony and I always say to the board, you know, there's no risk if there's nothing at stake. And we have a board that that's, has a very high risk tolerance, which I think is reflected in the nature of what the theater has become. That we've taken a lot of risks over years, and, and sometimes they don't pay off. Sometimes it doesn't work, but an awful lot of times it does. So I would say, actually, that our board more often is about pushing us um, to, be, um, to, to be more brave rather than uh, less so. What do you feel the future is, is going to be for uh, Berkeley Rep, and, and also what kind of projects do you need to undertake in order to make yourselves as strong as you can possibly be for that future? You mentioned housing as being one of the major uh, concerns. Are there other concerns that you have, uh, other, uh, other challenges that you'll be taking on? Uh, not so much uh, uh, what's going on on the stage, but just to make sure that, that Berkeley Rep remains the strong organization for presenting uh, theater that it is. Uh, so housing is a huge issue just because for us, for instance, in the last 10 years, our housing costs have grown from about $300,000 to $1.3 million in a very, you know, very short period of time. And we see those numbers just going up. And so we've just realized that is something we can't afford not to address. It's a fourfold increase. And it, yeah. and it looks like it's going to continue it's as, as this sort of spreads out from San Francisco That's into right. Berkeley, Oakland, and, and beyond. That's right. So that, you know, that's, that's just what it is. You know, I think one of the things that we keep finding is that being in the tech hub of the world also is, is that it's an expensive proposition. We can't afford not to be tech savvy. And, and there is no amount of money that you can spend that makes you as up to date as... Well, you can't compete is. for talent and you can't compete for infrastructure with the people who have made a profession out of commercializing that that's type right. of... So that's, of that's a challenge. I'm not sure that it's... I'm not, I don't actually know where to put it other than to acknowledge that it is a real, it is a real problem. You know, I think that um, we are seeing cha changed behaviors in part because of the housing issue, in part because of the traffic issues, um, getting people to feel comfortable m moving throughout the Bay Area when, it's, when traffic is crazy, when, um, when some portion of the population is, is, is finding themselves suddenly old, they never thought they would be. And, um, and, and so they're uh, more mobility challenged. Um, having, having a younger generation that doesn't have the disposable income that an older generation did, these are all things that will impact us. What I see as being maybe the, what I'd say are some of the larger sort of uh, macro, issues. macro issues are that in California, we now have three, two generations of children who've gone to public school without having an art, any arts education. Right. And, um, and so the challenge for us, what we keep finding is, you have to get people in the doors once if they're gonna come back. And it used to be that their once was in the schools, or they were in a school play, or they were in a school choir, or they were in a school orchestra, or whatever. And that's not happening any longer. And so the, the, um, the, ch the challenge of figuring out how to, how to compensate for the fact that the schools have left an enormous hole there, is, which is actually a problem for the schools as well as for, I, I, I don't mean that the, the function of the schools should be to provide a future audience for us. There's actually a real problem with kids not having access to creative outlets and, and the ability to succeed in forums other than in athletics and academics in an in, in, in academic environment. Well, because every study shows the kids who participate in arts programs actually function better in school. And in particular, when you have uh, children from uh, different backgrounds uh, diverse perspectives, uh, ethnicities, traditions, and so on, to bring people into the theater without any kind of cultural reference point that, that are, is provided by the public schools is, is very, it's difficult. very difficult. Well, Susan Medak, thank you so much for sharing the work of Berkeley Rep with us, and thank you so much for your insights.
It's a total pleasure. Thank you.